to be clear, you are not going forward with this. I'm gonna fix it myself. The evolution of Saul Goodman from Slippin' Jimmy to Gene Takovic. When we first see Saul Goodman in Breaking Bad, we are introduced to a scumbag lawyer deeply involved in all types of shady criminal behavior. Goodman was a dirty opportunist driven by greed and corruption. In Better Call Saul, we would slowly learn how he made the transformation from Jimmy McGill into Saul Goodman, and now that journey is complete. With four episodes still remaining, we were given the reveal that Jimmy's transformation was complete when Kim broke up with him. But that was merely the final big step in his journey. In his first childhood flashback, Jimmy sees his old man being played for a sucker. And despite warning his father he is being conned, his good-hearted old man remains an easy target. Jimmy learns a valuable lesson from the culprit about wolves and sheep. And when we see the finished Saul Goodman product in Breaking Bad, he's clearly all wolf. But that wasn't always the case in Better Call Saul. At times, Jimmy embraced the role of a wolf. But the bigger lesson he took from all of this was not to become a sucker like his old man. But he wasn't all wolf. Not yet, anyway. The other key detail we learn from Jimmy's past is that he always idolized his big brother Chuck. And even way back then, young Jimmy was seeking a shortcut, wanting to know the ending of the story without enjoying the experience of it. We also know that young Jimmy evolved into Slippin' Jimmy, an opportunist con man. His partner in crime was his good pal Marco, and together they would run their hustle. All the fun and games came to an end for Jimmy after the Chicago sunroof incident that would totally change his life. Jimmy cried to his mother on the phone about being in jail, and mom had Chuck swoop in to save the day. Chuck agreed to help Jimmy if he cleaned up his act, and Chuck got Jimmy a job at the HHM mailroom. All the fun and games with Marco were now in the past. After beginning his job in the mailroom, Jimmy's desire to please and obtain the approval of his big brother Chuck became a primary motivation. He also met Kim Wexler at this time. Inspired by Kim working the same job as him while attending law school and ultimately becoming a lawyer, Jimmy decided to follow her example in secret. Jimmy always idolized Chuck, and in his mind, becoming a lawyer just like his brother would be something that would make him proud. Jimmy labored his way through working in the mailroom while also taking courses at a correspondence school, the University of American Samoa. As his friendship with Kim grew closer, and Jimmy finally passed the bar, Chuck vouched for him in front of the bar committee. But unbeknownst to Jimmy, Chuck resented his kid brother. Chuck is around 15, 16 years older than Jimmy, so for most of his childhood, he was the center of the universe for his parents. Then along came Jimmy. Chuck would become a model citizen and a powerhouse intellect, unlike his degenerate kid brother. Jimmy was a troublemaker, Jimmy was a thief who robbed his own family, and Jimmy preferred shortcuts to hard work. But Jimmy's charisma made him inherently likable despite his inclination toward shortcuts. Everyone loved Jimmy, especially their beloved mother. Chuck's resentment towards Jimmy was on full display when their mother cried out for Jimmy with her dying words. Chuck was jealous. Chuck was the one who refused to leave her side. Jimmy was out getting a sandwich. And Chuck lied, never telling Jimmy what happened in her final moments. Jimmy thought becoming a lawyer would make Chuck proud, but in reality it embarrassed him. It was a sick joke. Chuck had Howard block Jimmy from getting a job at HHM. Jimmy had become a lawyer around the same time Chuck's marriage began falling apart. And that is when Chuck started to claim he was suffering from electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Jimmy's desire to please Chuck took greater form, as Jimmy literally took care of his big brother, providing him ice and goods and newspapers and taking care of him. All the while Jimmy was out to please his big brother, 
his brother was actively blocking him from becoming a lawyer at HHM, making things difficult for him, and doing so in secret, pretending he was on Jimmy's side and that Howard was the real enemy. Chuck wound up in the hospital following the stolen newspaper incident, and Jimmy ignored the doctor's suggestion that Chuck needed help, that his problems were not physical, they were mental. Instead of doing the right thing and giving Chuck the chance he needed to get real help, Jimmy's unrelenting urge to please his older brother and gain his approval took over. Instead of doing what Chuck needed, Jimmy opted to do what Chuck wanted. Eventually, Jimmy would learn that it wasn't Howard, but it had been Chuck all along. His older brother had betrayed him, the brother whose every need Jimmy had been taking care of. This betrayal led Jimmy down a path that brought him back to Marco, Marco's last hurrah as it were, where Marco claimed to have had the best week of his life. The important thing to remember here is after feeling a deep sense of betrayal from Chuck, a broken Jimmy returned to his slipping Jimmy roots. Even though it was a short-term plan where he needed to cut loose and vent, he instinctually embraced his con artist past. Chuck and Jimmy had their back and forth with the forged papers and the secret tape recorder and the big scam when Huell performed his reverse pickpocket swap like the smooth operator he is. Chuck eventually takes his own life. By this point in the story, Jimmy and Kim are an item. They have shared their fair share of scams. They become a toxic influence on one another. And this all culminates with ruining Howard Hamlin's good name. Along the way, Jimmy gets mixed up in the cartel, which gets Kim in the game, and that world collides with their scheming fun and results in Howard getting killed. They also got married following a moment where they seemed to be on the verge of breaking up. All of these factors contributed towards the drive to ruin Howard, where she never came clean to Jimmy that she was visited by Mike, and more importantly, that she knew Lalo was alive. So Kim Wexler was indeed the only thing preventing Jimmy McGill from going all in on Saul Goodman. But it goes even deeper than that. Kim didn't just break Jimmy's heart when she ended the relationship, but Kim also admitted she betrayed Jimmy. She knew Lalo was alive. And she never told Jimmy because she knew he would call off the Howard scheme and they would break up. This was the second time a dearly loved one had betrayed Jimmy McGill. Except this time, he wasn't just being betrayed by a big brother whom he idolized. He was being betrayed by his soulmate, his one true love. We know this represents the final descent into becoming the scumbag Saul Goodman we know from Breaking Bad. And Goodman handled Kim's betrayal not unlike he did when he first learned Chuck betrayed him. By embracing his inner slipping Jimmy, Saul Goodman is the finished polished product, an opportunist low-life lone wolf, preying on unwitting sheep in cunning ruthless style. It's as if Saul Goodman is vicariously living the life he and Kim may have led had Howard not become a casualty of their dirty work. Indeed, Goodman is embracing many of the characteristics Kim had suggested for him. The car, the cathedral of law, the location, the type of clients, the flashy style, the slogan. It's as if Saul Goodman from Breaking Bad is the personification of what Wexler had in mind for the character. It's almost like he's living a demented tribute to his former life of crime alongside Kimmy Corleone. Fast forward to Gene Takovic. Gene is a paranoid, frightened man, living a sheltered life that goes against everything Saul Goodman once stood for. The only real satisfaction he experiences is through living in the past. Whether he's watching his old television commercials, signing his name, afraid to set off alarms, suffering anxiety complications from his omnipresent paranoia, or giving advice to a young punk where he summons his inner lawyer. Gene is living in the past, missing the life he lived as Saul Goodman. Now Gene needs to contend with Jeff the cab driver. Jeff and his buddy definitely exuded a sinister vibe, as did Jeff's entire confrontation with Gene. 
Jeff knows who Saul Goodman is, and worse yet, he knows that Goodman has fled Albuquerque and uses an alias. Jeff seems shady, and this feels like a play on a common theme in the Breaking Bad universe, where one crook is quick to roll over another. Easy prey, the type who won't go to the police. This is exactly like what Nacho did to Price, except that guy wasn't too bright and went to the cops anyway. Jeff has leverage over Goodman, and Goodman knows it. The one lesson young Jimmy has always put into practice from a young age was that he wasn't going to become a sucker like his old man. Now he's going head-to-head -head with a predator wolf who has Gene in a vulnerable situation. Gene has been longing for the good old days, when he was doing his hustle as Saul Goodman in all of his glory. And we know his life as Goodman was lived out almost like a demented tribute to Kimmy Corleone, who helped sculpt what would become the finished product following her betrayal. Whatever new information we learn about Saul Goodman from the Breaking Bad timeline will almost certainly be relevant, thematically at least, with regards to the final showdown between Gene Takovic and Jeff the Cab Driver. Will Gene Takovic embrace his inner Saul Goodman one last time? Does he still have what it takes to fend off a predator wolf? Or is Gene Takovic headed for a fate where he finally becomes that which he most fears? A sucker like his old man before him. I believe whatever new information we get before Gene's story resumes, whether it's from the Breaking Bad timeline, whether it's something still from the Better Call Saul timeline, whether it's maybe something after Breaking Bad but before Gene got a job at the Cinnabon, or whether it's another childhood flashback to Jimmy, or perhaps even a flashback with Chuck and or Kim. Whatever new information we get about McGill Goodman in the next few episodes will likely provide some very important puzzle pieces that fit in with Gene's battle against Jeff the Cab Driver, Goodman's Last Stand. Can't wait for the final four. I'm done. I am done. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful night. This is Rummy's Corner. Except this isn't fucking Rummy's Corner, you dumbass. Rummy's Corner. He's conning you. Jimmy. What if you're wrong? Is she gonna be okay? She'll be fine, Jimmy. How do you know? Just listen. Wolves and sheep. Figure out which one you're gonna be. Mom took it upon herself to call you. I was just letting her know where I was. You didn't cry to her on the phone? What? No. You didn't cry and beg Mom for help. Jimmy. No, Mom, it's me, Chuck. Jimmy. No, Mom. You have the power to help your brother. Truly help him. Ignoring this won't make it go away. We're working together on this? Mm, that's up to you, Jimmy. You're not a real lawyer. University of American Samoa, for Christ's sake. An online course? What a joke. Couldn't keep his hands out of the cash drawer. But not our Jimmy. Couldn't be precious Jimmy. In the end, you're going to hurt everyone around you. You can't help it. So stop apologizing and accept it. And go our separate ways. Or we're... Or what? Maybe we get married? You may kiss. Psst, psst. One more. Ah! 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 That is not cool. I know who you are. You know who you are. Let's just get past that. Apart, we're okay, but together, we're poison. Stealing them blind, and he gets to be a lawyer? What a sick joke. I should have stopped him when I had the chance. Better call Saul. There we go. It's an honor. I'll see you. Jane. Oh,
Yes, I'm not. Yes, I'm not. Delicious chicken noodle fry. Yes, I'm not. Yes, I'm not. You know, Quasimodo predicted all this. Who is it? That, my friend, is Albuquerque's public enemy number one. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But the truth is, you've never mattered all that much to me. I love you. I love you too. But so what? You know who I had in my cab once? Sammy Hagar. <laughs> He's even more famous than you. I'm gonna fix it myself. You're done. You are done!